Hey, everyone. Let's get started. So a few quick announcements are up on the board. Probably the most important one is there's an in-person guest lecture here at the regular time on Wednesday. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be recorded. I'm not sure yet if we're going to post the video online. So please try to be there in person. Um, it will sort of the material from the quiz I mean, the material from the lecture may be on the quiz, which will be released Wednesday afternoon, um, due Sunday. Um, that's probably the most important announcements. Um, I won't have office hours on Wednesday because um, I'll have just released the project, and so I'll have office hours on Friday instead. Any questions about logistics? Okay. Um, this week's quiz. Uh, actually, that's a good question. I haven't decided yet. Uh, oh, so, so last week's quiz will definitely, last week's guest lecture will definitely be on this Wednesday's quiz. Um, this week's guest lecture um, will, yeah, I haven't decided. Yet. It's probably going to be on this week's quiz just because the final quiz won't be until like probably after Thanksgiving or right before things. Like it might just be too long. Um, and so, yeah, it'll probably be on this week's quiz. Any other questions? Oh, okay. my clicker is working now. Any other questions on announcements? OK. So let's just do a summary of where we are with the experimentation section just to motivate what we're going to do today. So, so far, we've covered a bunch of different experimental designs. Um, and when I mean experimental designs, I mean we randomize a bunch of units into treatment and a bunch of treatments into control. And then during the experiment period, we look at the difference between those treatments and uh, sort of those treatments and um, the treatment units and the control units. And we have like a few different methods to do that. We can think about just classic A-B testing in which you randomize at the level of the individual. You can think about spatial or graph cluster randomization where we randomize units by regions of space or some like abstract notion of like different markets in your marketplace. Um, and then we've thought about switchbacks, which is also randomizing over time. And so the same individual can be in treatment or control at different times um, of your experiment. And so these methods are all good at various uh, sort of for various kinds of interference. Um, but none of them are workable for what's a very common um, setting in these uh, in marketplaces, but just like in life, which is what if you have a product or a feature or a law that's public facing? So you can't roll it back. You can't be like, okay, this law is going to apply this week and then not next week, um, and then maybe for two weeks after that, and so on. So it just like once you launch it, you have to keep it launched, uh, or like it'll be embarrassing to roll it back. Um, or what if like your interference really is network or citywide, and so you can't find independent clusters um, for your randomization? Um, or what if yeah? Or what if you know? In addition to being like public facing and embarrassing to roll back, it's like quite sensitive. It's like something that requires a lot of communication, a lot of debugging, and like you want to make sure you get it exactly right. And so you can't launch in many cities at once. You just have like launch in one or two cities. Um, or what if it just takes a long time for the effect to occur, right? So it's something that affects your marketplace, but you don't really see, um, you know, it's, you know, maybe it affects the number of, like, drivers in your ride-hailing marketplace or your number of sellers, something. And, like, you know, it takes a few months for, like, people to realize this is happening and for recruitment to be affected by the experiment. And so, like, this is, these are all incredibly common um, sort of, facts that sometimes happen, and you still want to measure the effect of your change, and none of the experimental techniques that we've covered so far work. And so today, we're going to talk about um, uh, a method that does work. It's, you know, depending on who you ask, it's either an observational um, data technique or a, a, an experimental technique, depending on how you view it, look at it. It's called synthetic control, and I'll dive in in a little bit. And then 
we'll also do a few other things just to wrap up the experimentation module. OK. So synthetic control. So let's just give a little bit of motivation first. So um, the quotes on this slide are from um, sort of a review article on applied uh, econometrics, which sort of is the field that like, you know, looks at observational data and tries to sort of study the effects of various policies. Um, so it's a review of this, like the state of this field by Susan Athey and Guido Imbin. So Guido won the Nobel Prize in Economics this year. Susan will probably win it sometime in the next five, 10 years. Um, and so what do they say? They say that, so the gold standard for drawing inferences about something is the randomized control experiment. And so we've, we've covered hopefully a lot of methods that like hopefully you understand that running randomized control methods, uh, randomized control trials, it might be fun, but it also is challenging. But yeah, so they say that that's the gold standard to measure the effect of something. Um, but like I said in the previous slide, in many cases, experiments are difficult or impossible to do um, for a variety of reasons, some of which I talked about in detail on the last slide. And then in these settings, they say that synthetic control, which is the method I'm going to talk about today, is arguably the most important innovation um, in the literature in the last 15 years. OK. And so slightly bit more of motivation. So um, think back to that setting of like when you might use such a thing. Now, of course, uh, like so sort of the, that setting is very often like true in like policy situations. So if you want to study the effect of gun laws or an immigration policy or minimum wage, you can't like do a switchback experiment where you run in some cities, like, you know, you run in this city for some amount of time and then roll it back and then like go back and forth. Um, we also, you know, as much as people like to say that cities are the laboratory of democracy, that is, that is somewhat true, but you can't just like, you know, at a federal level assign different cities to different policies. Cities are gonna opt in or opt out. And so you need to be able to uh, think about what the effect of that is. And so, so the effect, the method I'm gonna talk about today has been used to, for example, study the effect of a minimum wage increase that applies to just one city or one state, or um, sort of the effect of some shock that led to more immigration in one city. And then outside academia, a bunch of organizations, so this is from another paper um, sort of summarizing synthetic control, um, uh, Alberto uh, Abadi. And so outside academia, a bunch of organizations, think tanks, business analytic units, governmental agencies, so on, use it. Um, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, uses this method to evaluate sort of all of its educational programs. So they you know, invest billions of dollars in childhood education throughout the world, and they want to know, are our programs actually effective in like teaching people, like, you know, like teaching kids? And the issue is that like, you know, effectiveness of education isn't something that appears in a month. Like it's something that you need to follow these kids on for years. And then of course, um, sort of maybe the reason I'm also talking about or emphasizing the method is um, tech companies use it all the time. Um, for, for example, sensitive change, like if you do pricing or wage changes, you can't, um, that's public facing to the driver. Um, you often can't roll back those things very quickly. And so, um, they'll often launch, so the product that I was working on there, it's like sort of, it had like an iterative rollout where first launched in one city, saw how it went, and then launched in a few more cities and then like kept rolling it out. And so, so some of the slides that I'm gonna use today are actually um, from the Uber Marketplace experimentation team. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you without telling you what it is that it's important. So now let's actually go back to the setting and think about what we can actually do. So, okay, so let's remind ourselves of the setting again. You, you know, running, running standard experiments is hard for a variety of reasons. And so because of, uh, because of all of these effects, you might decide to just launch in one city. 
right? So you want, or, you know, um, let's say Miami increases its minimum wage and a bunch of other cities have policies that apply at different times or they don't apply the same policy or so on. Or you're a tech company that operates in several different marketplaces and you're just launching a change in one city. Okay, so you launch in that just one city and that city is going to be our treatment city, right? So you have treated that entire city. And what we want to know is what is control. So the, the, the name of the method is called synthetic control. And so as you might sort of guess, the entire point of the sort of the, the entire difficulty is knowing we've launched in one city, how do we get a control? And just as a reminder, why do we need a control? We need a control to calculate the global treatment effect. So um, what we care about is what is the difference between launching this treatment and not launching this treatment? What is like the, the change in my metrics because I launched as opposed to didn't launch? And so you can measure, you can get a handle on Y1, which is you know, the effect on my, like sort of the measure of my metric if I launched. But what you need is you need the subtraction. You need to know what would have happened in the city if I didn't launch the product. Yeah. So what would have happened if I didn't launch? Okay. So as the running example here, suppose you're launching a product at time t in um, in Miami, and your platform also has users and let's say Houston, Atlanta, and Orlando. And so what are possible things that we can use as control um, in measuring our treatment effect? Um, thoughts on possible, possible things we can use as control? Okay, so which one? Okay, so okay, so the so the question is what what can you use as other controls? And one of the answer was the other cities, and then maybe if you can't decide which one, maybe just like randomly pick one or something like that. Are there other thoughts? Okay, so um, okay, so the, so the next thought is um, and okay, so we want to use the other cities as control. Let's just use Orlando because our intuition says that um, Orlando is the most similar to Miami um, because they're in the same state. And so, you know, applies to the same regulations. If there's a hurricane, then it might affect Orlando and Miami equally and so on. Um, are there any other thoughts? Okay, so the other thought is to use somehow the mean of the other cities. So do you, do you want to sort of elaborate on like how you would do that? Okay. Okay. So, so the thought is to use the mean of the um, the other cities and to sort of use like a weighted mean um, in like the appropriate way. And so that's actually um, almost exactly what synthetic control is. And so we're going to talk about how to do that. Okay. okay. And so um, there, there's one other control that maybe y'all um, at this point are too clever to not use. But okay, so what's maybe the most naive thing? is just look at Miami before you launch the treatment, right? So you have historic, like you know, Miami has been on your platform for a long time. You have historical data about Miami. So let's just use um, historical data from time zero to time T of Miami, and then use that as control. And then um, use as treatment Miami when you actually launch the treatment, right? So a classic before after. The main challenge with that, of course, is um, I, I say seasonality here, but in general, just your marketplace is not constant over time. And so this is that image that I talked about last week from Airbnb, sort of um, with the nice quote that 
um, like just like standard marketplace underlying variability is often way bigger than any, like the effect of any treatment that you care about, right? So like just the fact that it's Christmas time as opposed to mid-March affects how many bookings are gonna happen on Airbnb way more than anything Airbnb can choose to do. And so if you just naively use the same city, then oftentimes you don't sort of um, normalize for that. Okay, so what's the next idea? So you can maybe do like a seasonality adjusted Miami, right? You can say, I know that December is busier than mid-March in Airbnb, and so I can, I can adjust for that somehow. Now you might run into problems like unforeseen events, right? So what if you launched a week before like the world shut down because of COVID? Then um, like no amount of seasonality adjustments would have sort of foreseen that happening. Okay, and so the next idea is pick one of Houston, Atlanta, Orlando from, uh, from during the experimental period. And so that takes care of the seasonality effect. And so we had one nice argument for like why you might wanna pick Orlando. It's in the same state, it's geographically close by, it's probably the most comparable city. Um, one could probably make similar arguments for Atlanta and Houston, so I, I might embarrass myself about geography, but maybe Atlanta and Miami have a similar number of residents. I don't know. But so you, you can make some other argument for city size um, that um, like whatever, you, you, like you, you can make up different distance metrics for why your um, treatment, like why your treatment effect should be similar in these two cities. And then you can pick the city that's like closest to Miami. And then the hope would be that this like either seasonality or any other time adjusted thing affects the control city similarly to how it affects Miami. And so for example, if there's a, a new regulation in Florida, if there's a hurricane um, in Florida, then you probably would have wanted to pick Orlando um, over the other control cities. But if there's something else that only affects cities above a certain size or cities with certain industries, then you might have wanted to pick Atlanta or Houston instead, right? So the, so the hope is that whatever you pick is affecting the control city similarly. Um, yeah, so good question. So I guess the, so the question is, is if you're picking similar, then wouldn't you want, then wouldn't that potentially mean that these markets interfere with each other and then you would want them both in treatment or both in control? And so I think that's not quite true, that things can be similar without necessarily interfering with each other. So for example, um, suppose the, the thing that we want to measure is the effect of um, a new minimum wage law in Miami then um, even, if, even if Miami and Houston are very similar in some metrics, there's no reason to believe that like, higher minimum wages in Miami like, dramatically affects the labor market in Houston for like, minimum wage jobs. But it could be that it does dramatically affect the, the labor market for minimum wage jobs in Orlando. And so those would interfere. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, so that's a great question, but similarity and interference are not necessarily always the same. Um, yeah, good question. So the question um, is like, what if you have a bunch more cities, right? Um, so what if you have like Singapore and Hong Kong and Paris and like a bunch of other cities that are um, sort of a priori very different from Miami compared to Houston and Atlanta and Orlando? Would you just take the raw mean? Um, and so, no, so I haven't gotten to what is like how you actually do the synthetic control, but it doesn't amount to just taking a raw mean 
of like all the other cities you have. Okay. Um, let me hold off on that question until I tell you what the method is. And I think there's, there's two answers to your question, one that can be taken care of, the other the one that can't. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question is, couldn't you just do like the month before and the month after? And hopefully that takes care of seasonality. Is that the? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so yes. Yeah. So so the question is like you can take care of the same. So the the other issue is that a lot of these marketplaces grow like tremendously year on year, right? So there's like in the first ten years of Airbnb, they were probably growing like okay, I'm gonna embarrass myself by putting out a number, but at least fifty percent a year or some like ridiculous amount. And so December twenty nineteen probably does look very differently than December twenty twenty. And so, yeah, you can, then you can think about like normalizing a whole bunch of other things, like like growth rate and things like that. But then now you're getting into trouble about like all the different ways to normalize. Um, but sort of, um, I, I don't want to sort of be too negative on that. Is sort of that does end up playing a role. Sort of like you do end up doing some seasonality adjustment and synthetic control, and I'll talk about that. Or talk about how Uber does it in practice. Any other thoughts here? Okay. Yeah, so the challenge is which city do I pick? And the problem is that maybe no city is perfect. Okay. And so, what is the main idea of synthetic control? Is so the problem of using past Miami, just to emphasize this is that the future might be different from the past for nothing to do with the treatment. So seasonality, so on. The problem with using Houston is that Houston is not Miami, that you know, the two cities just differ for a whole bunch of reasons. And what happens during the treatment period, if there's you know, a hurricane in Florida, what happens um, in Miami might not be like a function of the treatment, but a function of the hurricane. And so the, the main idea of synthetic control, which um, some of y'all sort of started on, is use a weighted average of, like, of all the cities that you have. Um, and you sort of construct the weighted average using data from the past. So construct the weighted average from time zero to time t. And then use the weighted average, uh, sort of use what happens in those uh, control cities well, from that synthetic control during the experimental period. So you construct it with, from the past, and then you use whatever happened in those cities from time t to 2t. And then sort of the hard part is designing weights such that the synthetic Miami is, matches the real Miami, at least in the past. And then the hope is that synthetic Miami in the future behaves similarly to what Miami would have behaved like if you didn't launch the treatment. And so to answer your question, um, so the question was that what if you have a city like Las Vegas, which has you know, things like, you know, sort of, there's a lot of things peculiar to Las Vegas that don't depend on that, like on observables like city size and like, you know. Um, you know, demographics of the city and so on. And so how do you construct synthetic Las Vegas? And sort of the idea is you, you use a weighted average not to match things like demographics, but you use the weighted, um, um, you construct the weighted average to match the actual metric of interest. And so let me do that on the next slide. So this is the control period from time zero to time t. And suppose you have some metric, so this is whatever your, like, your metric y is. And you try to construct a synthetic city that matched the actual city 
from all times in the past. And so let's say we're talking about minimum wage in Las Vegas. And um, for now, let's pretend all the synthetic, you know, sort of like no other cities is changing their minimum wage during this period. So let's suppose we're trying to test uh, minimum wage in Las Vegas and we want to see the effect on, um, you know, like minimum wage jobs or like restaurant jobs or something like that. Then we, we would try to create the synthetic city that matches the number of restaurant jobs in Las Vegas all throughout the entire um, control period. And so um, we, we sort of, and there's a whole bunch of various ways that I'm not gonna get into on how to find, like how to do, like the, how to find the right weighted average that matches all of this over time. You have to be like careful about training and validation and not overfitting and all of that. Um, I don't want to get into that here. But um, yeah, so, so the hope is that you can find something like this. And so even for Las Vegas, the hope is that even if like no other, like even if demographics sort of aren't a good um, sort of proxy, that you can like directly look at the metric of interest and find a weighted average that matches the metric of interest. Um, yeah. Yeah, so you can't. So, so that's where synthetic control sort of, like it, it doesn't like get around all the interference things that we talked about, right? Like at the end of the day, you have some treatment, you have some control, and if there's interference between control and treatment, you're like sort of host. Yeah. And so um, usually you have to make assumptions that, they're, that, that you don't have interference. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you're you're trying to create a fake city using the metrics of the other city that weighted will match the metrics of Miami and the control. I think it's later. Um, yeah. So yeah. So uh, si similarly, yeah. You can think about that. You can think about it just like doing a linear regression over time. Yeah, so you have to like take care of the time and so on, but yeah. Um, the, one of the papers that I linked to um, earlier sort of like is like a good, I'm not sure if I posted it on as like a suggested reading, but it's on, the link is on this, the name is on the slide. So I would just look at that. I think it's on there. Yeah, so that's a good question on like what metrics do you actually do this for? Um, usually people just do the actual metrics of interest in the experiment. So whatever like your endpoint is, that's you make sure that it matches before and after. Yeah, exactly. So like when you take the weighted average of the past in those cities, it would patch the past, it would match the past of Miami. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question is like, how do we know we're not overfitting in the treatment period, in the control period? So often, so what I'm about to show you, so there's some like control period and then there's some treatment period. Um, and so in reality, you would also have what's called a validation period. And so, or you can think about doing cross-validation, like leave one out cross, like, like how, however you like standardly do cross-validation uh, or validation, you can think about applying those methods here. So the simplest one is you could have a validation period where suppose from time zero to like 0.8 T, you have the training. And then from 0.8 T to T, you just have validation. So you see how did that weighted average do um, for some data that I've already observed in the past, um, but for which it wasn't trained on. Um, you can also do like leave one out cross validation that you can, for example, for, you can do that like in a rolling way, right? So like use data before this point to train 
the weighted average and then see how it does on this point, like sort of on this entire range, then you can, you know, see use the data from this past and sort of check in the future and to like sort of do a rolling validation. Um, yeah, so you would certainly want to do all of those things. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's not actually like this method would automatically learn or like as much it's useful that like, you know, population matters or uh, like regulation matters or so on. Any other questions here? Okay. And so once you train this thing, then all you do is so you, then you launch the experiment. And then you just observe what happened in the actual city and what happened in your fake synthetic city. And then your treatment effect is just the difference. And that's it. Um, and to get to, I guess, the second part of your question, which, yeah, so the, so the uh, first part of the question is, yeah, you just sort of use the, the metrics to create the weights. And so even if Las Vegas sort of, it doesn't matter that like demographics is not representative of like what happens in Las Vegas. Um, if there's like other things that are represented enough that you can find these good weights, then you're fine. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is that the central assumption is that these weights, sort of the relationship of these weights remains okay, like sort of remains the same before and after the treatment. So um, like sort of after the treatment happened, um, sort of like sort of like in this future time, there wasn't something like that would have changed the weights. And so maybe one way to think about that is suppose in this like pre-treatment time, um, like there wasn't a hurricane. And so, like, you know, it found that for the most part, like, put a lot of weight on Houston. And then during the treatment time, like, a hurricane happened to hit uh, Miami and sort of like how Miami behaved got decoupled from like the synthetic Miami that's mostly based on Houston. And so, this, this method assumes that that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, so okay. So, so, no, so what you're learning is you're learning weights on the cities. So you're saying, I'm going to put 0.5 on Houston, 0.3 on Orlando, 0.2 on Atlanta. And so you're learning those three numbers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you learn those three numbers for you, so you, for different cities. And you set those numbers such that, let's say revenue is your metric that you care about. You set those numbers such that in the, pre, in the control period, in this pre-treatment period, that revenue in your synthetic city equals the revenue in Miami for this entire period. And then your synthetic control is 0.3 or what, what did I say? 0.5 times Houston during the treatment period plus 0.3 times Orlando plus 0.2 times Atlanta. Yeah, so you're just learning weights. Yeah. And this like vanilla synthetic control. What do you mean more data? Yeah, so yeah, so I don't want to get into actually training all of this, but yeah, so I mean, there's like certain assumptions I'm sweeping under the rug, and like you'll need the, I mean, you, you'll need the, like the pre control, like sort of the pre treatment and the treatment data for all of those cities. And this also assumes that, like, for example, you're not launching a different treatment in like any of the control cities at the same time. 
Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is that all of those, like whatever like events like that, that could happen in the treatment also happen in the control and contributed to your weights, right? So like the hope is that like, yes, I mean, hurricanes happen, but hurricane, I mean, okay, like maybe hurricanes are too extreme that if your experiment's one week and like the hurricane was that entire week, you just have to throw out the experiment. Like there's probably nothing you can do about that. But if, you know, if your treatment period was three months and there was like one week of a hurricane and the recovery and like that also happened in the control period, right? Your control period was three months or your pre-treatment period for training was three months and like there was a hurricane in that three months as well. Then the hope is that like that's taken into account in the city weights, right? That like the hope is that that would have led to a higher weight in Orlando, for example. And so um, even if that happens in the treatment, your weights are like helping you, like sort of your synthetic control is helping you normalize for that. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So the like like so the question of variance is definitely here because in in some sense you only have one unit of treatment and one unit of control, and you, you are going to have high variance now. Like depending on like there's a whole bunch of things on like how that unit is counted. Like maybe you can think about each time slice as a different unit. Um, so like kind of like you would do in switchback. And so like yeah, standard error calculations get a little weird, but and I don't want to get into that, but yeah, you certainly should be thinking that this is like a super high variance method, right? So like, if if you have a one week synthetic control, I mean, like you want like the point of this isn't to have like a, synthetic control usually isn't for like one week things. It's like usually something for like months or like months or years. Um, but like yes, I mean like if you have like a one week thing and a hurricane comes, there's like nothing that like that's variance, right? There's like nothing that can protect you against having just terrible estimates because of that hurricane, to the point where like you probably just have to throw out the experiment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, certainly, sort of like, um, everything you would do in like in the face of like a high variance experiment, you need to be careful about here. Yeah, so like like synthetic control is great, and I hope like all those quotes convince you of that. But it is something you have to be very careful about running. And um, like if you can run a real experiment, do that. Um, this is, no, I mean, I think your, your intuition is right. This is usually done for like large changes. Yeah. Um, and that's because like for smaller changes, you can often run a real experiment. Um, and to get to, I think, the second part of your question, um, like you're right in that like, like suppose something had, like, you know, I, I was talking about hurricanes before, but like take Las Vegas, right? Suppose during the treatment period, you know, whatever the treatment was, there's like a federal ban on gambling, right? That's going to affect Las Vegas way more than it's going to affect any of the controls. And so your, your weighted, your synthetic city probably like no longer matches. Like it's probably not a good proxy for what would have happened in Las Vegas. And so even if it was a good proxy in the treatment, in the pre-treatment period. 
Um, good. So the question is, is what about like, can you compare the effect of synthetic control to something in simulation? And that's a little harder because like this, what the simulation is really good at is like, like micro simulation. So like, you know, if I, if I change my matching algorithm, um, sort of how does that affect like the distribution of supply in this part of the city to that part of the city, right? Or if I slightly change my pricing algorithm under maybe loose assumptions on what's going to happen in behavior, how does that like, what is like the citywide effect of like a small change in behavior? Right, so like you should really think about these simulations as micro simulations. Um, synthetic control is often like, you know, I'm changing, uh, like you know, I'm launching a minimum wage for the platform in this city. It's like it's just like really hard to predict the behavioral effects, and so it's hard to simulate. Yeah. Yeah, so you can like hopefully the your your control is pretty good. But like if you know if you have just one treatment and something happens in that treatment city, then like sort of the relationship between the control and the treatment would go away. Um and then this is the second slide, or this is I guess the first slide. I just used that image from Uber, but sort of the second slide sort of shows what they do in um, to form their, uh, their synthetic. And like once I lay out that you want to do this weighted average thing, there's like no reason you can't do more complicated machine learning stuff, right? So what they end up doing is, yeah, like, yeah, they use this like weighted city average control city things, but then they also add in like seasonality and event data and like sort of like the treatment city stuff and the control period, right? So you can like add all of these things to form your good synthetic. And so for example, if like it does start raining and like, you know, hurricaning, okay, maybe not hurricaning, but like heavy rains in Miami during your treatment period, you can try like, given the actual realization of rain or not, you can try to con like adjust for that using past data on what happens in Miami when it rains. So um, yeah, so the real synthetic thing is like sort of, once I lay down this problem, sort of the name of the game is predicting what would have happened in your synthetic city. I mean, in your real city during the treatment period, if you didn't put the if you didn't put a treatment. And so now this is a prediction problem. And so so far, in like in academia, usually people use like weighted averages of cities, but this is a prediction problem that you can also throw in a bunch of other things. And so they do end up throwing a bunch of other things, and then. You know, you have to be careful about overfitting and like doing your machine learning correctly, but it's a prediction problem that you could theoretically um, sort of say, like, do good things with. And then maybe the last thing I'll show is so, literally, to generate this, um, this slide, all I did was go to Google Images and type in synthetic control. And like, this is like the first 15 images. And like if you if you run like if you run synthetic control, you'll often see, you'll uh, or you should see graph. Like ideally, you would see a graph like this. Ideally, you would see until the treatment two lines that are basically hugging each other, and then after the treatment, two lines that diverge. All right. This is like if you. I mean, this doesn't tell you you didn't overfit, but like if you didn't, if you don't have this line like hugging each other, like if you don't have two lines hugging each other before the treatment, then your synthetic control isn't very good. And if, you, if they don't diverge after the treatment, then like, you know, your, your treatment had no effect. Or me you measure that your treatment had no effect. So yeah, so the question is, is like, if your synthetic control is this accurate, like why, like why run the experiment? And so the issue is that you don't know how the treatment will behave. So your synthetic control is hopefully accurate for what would have happened in control in that city. But it doesn't tell you, right, you have absolutely no data on what happened in treatment. So for example, like let's just take the most extreme, let's just take the most extreme example. So 
you're, you're a marketplace that like, you know, cares about revenue in different cities. And you can say that, you know, I can, like, for this one month, I can pretty well predict the revenue in Miami if I knew the revenue in the other cities in this month, right? So that's, that's what the, the training period is trying to do. And then the treatment is, what would my, 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 tr uh, my treatment is, is I, I like, just like destroy the marketplace in that city, I just leave the city, right? Then, um, like, you know, revenue is going to go to zero, but like no amount of prediction can tell you from the other cities that, right? Like you would need data from the other cities where you withdrew from that city, right? Because the, the other cities are always in control. And so you have, until you run the experiment, you have no data from any city that's in treatment. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, is like, how do we like evaluate this thing? And it's, um, I mean, it, it's hard. Yeah, it's, um, you, you often like, it's sort of, I mean, this is true for all causal inference and all experimentation, right? Like, at the end of the day, even if we're experimenting on one individual, we can't know what that individual would have done if we sent them a coupon versus not sent, like, right? You can, we can only know one of the potential outcomes. We can only know we can either send them a coupon or not. And like all of experimentation is, is we pretend that that person would have behaved similarly to other people in that scenario. And then we can like run an experiment that way. And like sort of there's still that central assumption. We can't get around the fact that we can't observe both outcomes for the same individual. And so same in synthetic control is that like this is sort of a method of last resort. And so, I mean, I mean, maybe not. Like, it is often a method that you, like, you're doing because you, like, possibly can't run an experiment. And so it's, like, you, you can do the standard things of, like, you know, doing validation periods and things like that. But at the end of the day, you need, um, like, the treatment. Yeah. Um, you could also think about doing AA tests sometimes. So, for example, um, and that's similar to validation, but think of that as like test instead of validation, is like what, what would have happened if like there wasn't actually a treatment? Like if like no treatment actually launched and so you do know like that that city is actually in control, what, what do the predicted cities, say? like what does the synthetic control say versus the actual city that is actually in control? Yeah, so, so, so by training the control, I mean finding the weights of the cities that, that such that during the pre-treatment period, like the revenue matches or whatever that these, line, that these lines match. Yeah. So like, I mean, it's the same as classical overfitting that if, if I had a million cities, right? If I, if I had a million other cities, I could finally, I could probably find some combination of those cities such that like in the pre-treatment, they like line up exactly. But like that doesn't mean that they're gonna line up exactly in the future because like it was just like a spurious correlation. I mean, so you can do validation, right? So you, so like for example, um, you, you like train, so like I, I'm drawing a vertical, line with my pointer. So you train during this period, so like before this vertical line, and then you, you validate with this period where you know, like where you, where you actually do see the city still in control. And so you have, you have the ground truth. And then you can also do like cross validation or rolling validation, leave one out and all the, like all the other standard validation techniques. Um, and I just want to point out maybe this plot in particular, sort of the rightmost, where you see sort of over time, everything is fault, like this metric is fault, like over 
this is, I, I, I forget which paper this is from, but this is over 30 years. And this metric of interest is falling throughout that entire 30 years in both treatment and control. And so this is something that, like, for example, the, like, taking the same city pre-treatment and pre-control and treatment would have just, like, failed miserably, right? Because, like, everything is falling everywhere. And so you really do need some, like, synthetic to tell you how much would it have fallen before the treatment. Any other thoughts here? Okay, so maybe I'll leave you with this. Is, you know, this is a great method, but I think we touched on a lot of these, is the validity of synthetic control depends on important practical requirements and like perfunctory or like routine applications um, will, will often produce misleading estimates unless you're really careful. So like, this is um, like, I just wanted to like sort of teach this method um, as like a pointer. So if like if someone asks you to interpret one of these things, um, but actually implementing and doing synthetic control correctly is like something that you'll need a lot more reading to do. Um, like you can't just do it from what I taught in class. So, so you can think about overfitting to, so you, you can, so the question is, is like, we're just like, this is just one example, right? So what about like, sort of, as opposed to like machine learning, where like you're overfitting to multiple examples. So I think here you can think about different time periods as different things that you could overfit to, right? So like you're overfitting to like this line in the past, but that doesn't mean that it relates to this, right? So you can think about the future as your like test set unseen set. And you can think about um, like each point in that in the each point in this line as a, a sample in your training data. Okay. Yeah. So, so I just want to end with this caveat that um, to like actually run one of these things um, requires a lot more reading and like care. And so, yeah, so we've talked about this quite a bit. Overfitting is a huge challenge. And um, sort of detecting when your like control breaks. So it's like detecting if there is an event where now the relationship you learned in the treat in the pretreatment period is no longer relevant. Okay, Yeah, so the, so the question is, like, won't this always happen that, like, something happens that you can't expect, that you don't expect? And so the problem isn't something happens that you don't expect. So, like, the problem isn't necessarily that there was a hurricane in Miami in this. Like, so, like, let's say the treatment period is a year, right? So the problem isn't necessarily that there was a hurricane in Miami. The problem is, is if there was a hurricane in the treatment period and there wasn't one in the, in the pre-treatment period, that like sort of was handled. So if there was one in the pretreatment period and because of that there's like more weights on Orlando, right? Then this is perfectly all right. And so it's more like is there something like new and unanticipated that changes the relationship between the synthetic control and the real thing? Yeah, so like in the Las Vegas example, if like, you know, you launch something and there's some other like federal law that bans gambling in the United States, right? There's like, like you're sort of just done. Like you can't, you can't recover from that. Or it would be extremely hard to. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, is like, there's going to be drift and like how good your synthetic is over time. Yeah, I, I don't have like great like general advice for it. Like, like that's certainly good. That's certainly true. Um, and like that's where, um, yeah, I, I think that's where you try to run, run like AA tests and things like that to like evaluate. Like if you're at a company, and like try to do like the shortest amount of time that's still meaningful for your metric. I'll take the remaining synthetic control questions offline. I just do have like a few other things I wanted to touch on um, before, like on the last day of the experimentation module. Okay, so I'll just do like a few questions about like I label this like quote unquote culture, but like just like the idea of like like what does a um, experiment driven company or like organization look like, and like how is that different from running just one experiment or um, like, yeah, like how you would run experiments in science. Okay, so let's just do like a quick primer on a classical power analysis that you might have like learned in, a, in like a, in a past stats class. Um, and if you didn't, that's perfectly all right. So well, you, you probably, or you might have learned the following procedure where you want to, you want to conduct what's called a power analysis. And what does that mean? You want to, uh, you want to say is if the true effect is at least as big as x, so like y1 minus y0 is at least x, um, then an experiment with n samples will reject the null hypothesis at least z percent of the time, right? And so you want to, so like if the actual effect is big, you want to reject the null hypothesis. And so with all the randomness, you want to reject it at least z percent of the time. And hopefully z is like, in like maybe classical power analysis, it will be like 80%. So like at least 80% of the time, you'll, you'll actually reject a false, false hypothesis, a false null hypothesis. And at the same time, if the true effect is actually zero, so if the null hypothesis is true, then you don't want to falsely reject more than alpha percentage of the time. And this is usually 5%, and that's why that's the interpretation of a p-value. And so you set p to alpha. And so what you might have learned is given x and given z and given alpha, it's trivial to calculate your sample size n. So, and what this is saying, what a power analysis is telling you is if this is like how, if you know, if I expect my product to improve sales by 1%. And I want to be able to like detect that one percent change. Then I need at least five thousand people in my experiment to be able to detect a one percent change and reject the null hypothesis. And so you might have learned the power analysis that that tells you how to calculate this n. And then you would just run an experiment with n samples, and you would just like you know fix n samples and then run the experiment. And this is what I'm going to call the scientific approach to experiments, right? You're, you're, you're setting a procedure that rejects false hypotheses and accepts true hypotheses, right? You reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false, and you fail to, sorry, I say accept, but that's, that's I shouldn't write, you fail to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Yeah, so X would be like 1%. So like, suppose you think sending coupons to people improves sales by 1%, then um, yeah, X would be 1%. Right, and so what this procedure is maximizing is if it actually improves sales, then you're going to um, accept that, like sort of you're gonna um, reject the null hypothesis. And if it doesn't improve sales, you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, there is a, a statistician would kill me for saying the words accepts, and I should, I should, that, that is a typo. I shouldn't have accepts here. I should have, you fail to reject true hypothesis. Okay. And my claim is that this is the wrong approach in organizations. Because in organizations, you don't care about doing good science. 
what do you care about? In organizations, you want to quickly launch, as quickly as possible, products that really, really work. Right? So if something has a 5% like sort of you know, improves, coupon, like, improves sales by 5%, you want to launch that faster and more often than if something improves sales by 1%. And OK, so you want to, as quickly as possible, launch like amazing things. And it's like fine if you don't launch something that would reject the no hypothesis, but is like small, right? So if like if something would increase sales by one by 0.1 percent, and um, and you know then the no hypothesis is false, but you like don't care, right? It's not like practically significant, even if it would be statistically significant with a big enough sample size. And it's also fine if you sometimes launch useless products. Right, like it's fine if you launch things with no effect size. Uh, like no one cares. You're not like making a permanent mistake in science. Um, but you just what you never want to do is you want to launch. You never want to launch a product that like actively hurts your metrics. So you don't want to launch things with negative or very negative effect sizes. And so. You should change your experimentation procedure, your power analyses, to optimize for doing this, where you're fine to launch, like where you really quickly want to launch big things and like everything else you don't really care. And what your advantage, but maybe also sort of difficulty, is that you have many possible products to launch, right? So um, often in these marketplaces, you have like hundreds of products or like UI changes or various things that you could be testing at any given time. And your limitation really is your sample size. Even at a place like Google that, you know, whatever has like hundreds of millions of active, or like maybe, I don't know how many active users a day, they're limited, you know, if they want to be running thousands of experiments at any given time, and each of those thousands of experiments have many different arms, their limitation is going to be sample size. And so, you want to sort of design an experimentation procedure that allocates your, like you should think about your sample size as your finite resource, as your constrained resource. And how do you allocate your sample size to the experiments most likely to give you like strong discoveries? Like most likely like help you discover like the five products that are like actually gonna change things. And on the other end, so this classic, like the classic approach on the previous slide is like doing the opposite in some sense. It's like optimized to find the smallest X that you care about. It's like it's optimized to find this like 1% thing. And if something is actually a 5% improvement, it doesn't like help you launch it any faster. And so as a result, you're wasting samples and time that you could be spending in other experiments. Any questions about this? Okay. And so um, I briefly just want to talk about what you should do instead. And so what the insight is, is that you have many, many possible products and experiments to launch. And if one product looks mediocre early into the experiment, just move on, right? It could be that that product would have done well if you just gave it 100 more samples. But like, it's not worth it because like, like, you know, the next experiment up is starting from a clean slate. And so you'd rather just do that. And so the idea is run an experiment just long enough to determine if it's an amazing product or if it's a dud. And how do you do that? You sort of do the opposite of what, uh, sort of, you do what I told you not to do in the beginning of the experimentation module, is you peek. You, like, you, you actively stare and how the experiment is doing, and then move on if it's not doing well. And the idea is just you, you, you want to peak in a smart way. Instead of peaking with the same 5% threshold of like, like the p-value, you peak in a way such that early on, sort of what this is saying is this, so you should think of the y-axis as the effect size, and the x-axis as like tie or the number of samples. And so early on, you like will probably continue sampling 
unless your effect is really, really big or really, really negative. And then over time, you sort of um, decrease the threshold where you um, accept if it's maybe a slightly smaller effect size and so on. And there's an asymmetry here, sort of, um, there's like a, a paper that talks about how to do this like optimally depending on your objectives and so on. And the asymmetry they have here is because like there's an asymmetry in like wanting to launch quickly for like really good things. Um, and so, but yeah, so okay. So, so the idea is that you can peak and do it smartly. And you have, so you have some upper threshold to declare victory and some lower threshold to also stop the experiment and declare a loss. And what I wanna point out here is this is bad science and probably unfair to individual products. So you'll, pro you'll often reject small things that would have made a positive difference if you do this approach. Like you'll like fail to launch a bunch of treatments that would have improved your sales by 0.1%. But the idea is that as a result, you get to launch the things that improve your sales by 1% or 5% as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't wanna think about this in terms of p-values, but sort of, yeah, if you wanted to think about this in p-values, you can sort of invert this graph. So smaller p-values are better, right? So you can sort of, you want to accept if it's really small early on and then reject if it's big enough early on and then sort of like adjust that threshold. Like sort of it's not a very clean inversion to this because like the p-value itself has like, um, like a notion of sample size inside. And so it's not exactly the opposite of this, but yeah, I, I think it's easier to think about it in terms of effect size, right? So like, if like 10 samples, right? And this, so like, think of this as like a medical trial that like saves the lives of everyone you give it to or like everyone you weren't giving it to died in like the first two weeks, right? Like even medical trials have a notion of stopping early if the effect size is that big. Or even medical so uh, trials will stop if there's like, you know, or will at least pause if like there's like, you know, a lot of side effects to the medicine early on. And so you should think about this as like, just like a large scale version of a medical trial where you have, where like in medical in medicine, you're not like, you're doing it more for ethical reasons. Here you're doing it because of sample size reasons that you would rather use that sample size for something else. And more generally, which I sort of, it's like in the same theme, but I'm not gonna cover it at all is you also have this idea of adaptive experimentation. Or like, suppose, so in that, in that example I gave at the very beginning of like Google showing 41 shades of blue to like figure out what color to have on its links. What they just did was they just gave approximately two and a half percent to each shade of blue and just let the experiment run for a while. A far more efficient thing would have been to do is to sort of like adaptively allocate samples to the um, to the arms that are more valuable. And so for like those of you going on to take um, like more operations and slightly more theoretical courses, you might learn something called banded algorithms or something called upper confidence zone. And sort of the idea is that you, you allocate samples to things where the best case scenario is pretty good. And so that automatically takes into account there, like if you don't know much about something, then the best case is like still that it's amazing. But if you know a lot about something and it's like not very good, then like you just get you just like stop doing it. And so you can think about adaptive experimentation where you allocate samples to different arms in the same experiment. Yeah, yeah, so you, so you can think about sort of these thresholds as drops. So in a classic power analysis, sort of even there you have some things that are determined by business requirements. So like how big the, the, the sort of how big of an effect size you care about, 
how often you want to detect it, and so on. Here, you would have the same business requirements, but here you can also think about as like there's like a cost to experimentation. There's like an opportunity cost to each marginal sample you allocate to this experiment. And like, given that would be like a business, like not like quite a business, but hopefully you would calibrate that cost from like running many experiments over time. And so you would learn what the opportunity cost of a sample is. Yeah, well, so what I want to push back on experiments being a costly thing, like hopefully sort of you, sort of you move your organization to a point where experimentation, like experiments are really cheap. That like it's like, like it's like one button to launch an experiment about like look at all the metrics and then just like do it well. And there's a lot of, for example, there's Optimizely, which is like a company that helps other companies run experiments. And like they have an API and you can like, join it to your website and things like that. And so hopefully you're at a point where experiments are not expensive. And what's like, like here what I talked about is like experiments are expensive in the sense that you're running thousands of experiments and like sample, like you want it like each individual experiment's not expensive, but like samples are now your limiting factor. And so, but, so there's that, but then there's um, sort of the second part, I think like the um, second part of your question I'll, I'll talk about right uh, in a little second. So I think I've talked about this on like bits and pieces and answering people's questions in the last few weeks. So I'll just like say that like another thing you would want to like just do this very quickly. So another thing that you often care about is like the simulation. So you build a simulator for how your work is going to perform. And there's a Lyft blog post I linked to that like does this micro simulation for like, like drivers uh, driving around and so on. And so you can like simulate various matching algorithms, various, various algorithms and like you might have to make assumptions on how people are behaving. So you might have to make like micro assumptions and then the point of your simulation is to detect what's happening overall. I'll skip this. And then this is where I think I'll get to your question. And so with all of that, here's like the general pipeline for launching a product. You're gonna come up with an idea, iterate on the design, code it up and evaluate it on a simulator and then test in a real experiment in one city. If that goes well over time, roll it out in multiple markets, and then continue rolling it out in more and more markets. And then eventually you'll have rolled it out everywhere. And sort of this XKCD that I showed at the beginning where like, you know, part three is check whether it works, sort of this entire process as a whole, you're like testing whether your idea works. And like individual parts of this, you will like, you know, do the various experimentation styles type that I talked about. And then your question is, is like, okay, what if you don't have this entire like framework to run experiments? Well, what like, how can I do this easier? Um, and so on. And so what I'll say there is like, you know, if you come up with if, like this first two stages of like, you know, coming up with the idea and iterating on the design, if like that was expensive and like, you know, took like a lot of like human power of your like person person hours on your team and like you just did a lot of work then like you're you know if, if people on your team are semi competent your your assumption should be that like your product is going to like at least do like you know might not be a terrible idea and so what like the the like trivial exp or like the easier experiment to run if you like you know don't want to be like super careful about power and like detecting large effects and like interference and things is like just launch it and like launch it in like one city or market. And as long as it doesn't do terribly, your prior should be that it's like a good idea. And so like keep launching it in more and more cities and work out the bugs as long as it's like not failing. 
and like that's like an easier approach but like often is a decent approach for big change yeah well yeah so you you, ought, you might not want to evaluate on the simulator i think what um sort of what that lift blog post talks about and this last thing i'll say i guess to say is what that lift blog post talks about is they make sure their simulator uses the same code base as their like actual product and so like to code it up in the simulator i guess you have to code up the simulator which is expensive and like you know probably don't want to do it in an early stage team but like at a medium stage team like sort of what that does is it reduces the building a simulator to a fixed cost you have to do once and then any team building any product that will be launched can just plug it into the simulator and so it's, it's not a recurring cost it's like a fixed cost okay so i know it's time so i'll probably cover all of this you know some of this next time um i just want to put up announcements here while people are walking out um, the biggest one is in-person lecture on Wednesday, please attend. 